Welcome to the Good Eggs of History podcast. Here we explore the more unknown historical rule breakers, the rebels, the brave, and the bonkers. I'm Hannah Shackle, and I'll take you on a journey to discover these absolute badasses. Today we'll be talking about Kati Mandiwa, a Celtic female queen who is less well known than Boudicca or Boadicea, but also deserves to be remembered. I'll be joined by the lovely Victoria Rives from Heritage Doncaster as well. I've got Victoria Rives with me today. Um, she's from Heritage Doncaster. Um, if you can explain a bit about what you do. Yeah, of course. So uh, my job at Heritage Doncaster is to take history and the museum objects we have at the Danham Gallery out into Doncaster's community and help to make history make sense to uh, people across the borough. White filly. That's what her name means. Conjures up images of a sweet, playful horse cantering round flowering fields. While Cartamandua might have been sweet and playful, her story is one full of a lot more fire and spirit. She was ruler of the Brigantis tribe from 43 to 69 CE, controlling territory from Northumberland to Lancashire, Yorkshire to Scotland. It was the largest and most powerful of Celtic Britain at the time, most likely inherited in her own right from her father. Women held a lot more power here than in the rest of the Roman Empire, for much of Britain was part of it at the time. Cartimandio had a difficult decision. She could either keep her lands and become a client ruler, or go to war against the full might of the largest empire the world had ever seen. Understandably, she went with stability. So lots of people might have heard of Boudicca. If you've watched Horrible Histories, <laughs> Boudicca is a character on there uh, with her kind of flame red hair. Mm. But Cartimandio is a lot less, a lot less well known. I was really drawn to her story to unpick kind of why that might be, why she's kind of less known, uh, less known in popular culture, but to kind of find out what she was doing at a similar time. And this is part of the reason why her story isn't as well known as Boudicca's is. Boudicca fought against the empire, fighting for the lost honour of her daughters, a David against Goliath, which it didn't end very well for her, but we all know the story of the heroine trying to fight for what's right. Romantic as it is, the reality was Cartimandua had lots of people and settlements to look after and she had vital trade routes running through her kingdom that had to be protected. She took the smart, if not very romantic, choice to live in relative harmony with the Romans. Who she didn't live in relative harmony with was her husband Venusius. Now, here was a template and poster boy for the bitter ex. A lot of marriages at the time were out of convenience or strategic, so many couples had extramarital affairs and it wasn't particularly frowned on. However, he thought she was taking it a bit too far when she decided to divorce him in favour of his low-born arms-bearer, Villocatus. This would have caused shockwaves in the aristocratic circles of the time, as he was not noble-born and social mobility was definitely not that possible. So, being completely not bitter... Venusius decided to launch a rebellion against Cartimandua in 57 CE, where she both wins through help from Rome and manages to take some of his family hostage, which must have stung. There's no record of what happened to the hostages, but it usually doesn't end too well for hostages. By the way, she would have led the army as well. She would have been right at the head of it, in the thick of the action, spurring her warriors on. All Celtic leaders did this, and the fact she was a woman did not change things. She still was expected to lead from the front. Previously, Venetius had been very happy to accept the wealth and protection of the Roman Empire, so you can't help wondering if it was a slightly more personal attack. A few years later, she marries Velocatus, the arms bearer, which caused a stir. It would have been quite unusual for the time, and this did cause some dissension in the court, but it seems she was very happy with him, enough to have risked her status anyway. There were lots of pockets of resistance springing across Britain against the Romans at the time. So Venusius slides on in and tries to exploit this sentiment by coming after Cartimandua again. A mere 12 years later, in 69 CE, so he's clearly fine and has definitely gotten over. She calls again for aid from Rome, but this time, because of all the dissension in the empire, they only managed to send some auxiliary soldiers. They also had four different emperors in one year, civil unrest across the empire, and unfortunately this time Venusius wins. We don't have any record of what really happens to Cartimandua. She's spirited away somewhere by the Romans, um, possibly to Chester. And unfortunately, there's not much recorded about her life beyond this. Tacitus, who is the main source of writing about Cartimandua, does not mention her again. 
It is possible he was writing her story as a moral tale. Look what happens to headstrong women who don't know their place, as Rome did not allow women the same power as Celtic Britain. Women who are possible adulteresses who do what they want. But then she had a good relationship with the Roman Empire, so it seems quite unlikely. It's possible that once she was removed from this position of authority, Tacitus simply didn't care about her anymore and didn't think she was worth writing about, which is quite sad. Cartimandua managed to keep her kingdom in a relatively strong, stable position whilst others in Britain were being slaughtered and scorched. She made a smart political move to help keep everybody safe, and her lands were some of the last that eventually were subsumed into the Roman Empire. And that was a bit of a karma, actually. Despite Venusius taking over Brigantia, he only ruled for two years before it was actually absorbed into Rome. What an idiot. She pursued someone that made her happy, despite objections from others, and eventually did marry him. I'd like to think that they lived out the rest of their lives together in obscurity in Chester. Probably not, but I'd like to think that. Cartimandua is a good egg because she kept power due to smart decisions. She was a warrior, she was a queen, went after what she wanted, and definitely deserves to be more remembered. And here's Victoria again to explain about the history project that she's involved with. So Her Story is a, is a group that runs every Tuesday morning in Denneby. Um, we've been running since 2018. And every week we get together and we interrogate the life of women in the past. And um, we try and relate it as close as possible to kind of women that were living right here in Doncaster. Um, and we try and work out you know, what life was like for them, um, whether we could relate to them, whether we've come up against anything similar in our lives and kind of reflect on how, how life for women has changed over time mm. or, or, or not really. Yeah. Um, and so each week we kind of we don't just it's not like a history lesson we don't they don't just sit and listen to me talk um it's all done through hands-on activities and we look at objects in the museum's collection and then create activities in response thank you victoria that was awesome thank you for listening i'm hannah shackle if you'd like to join in the conversation join me on instagram at at hannah shackle hotel alpha november november alpha hotel sierra hotel echo keela lima echo i love me some nato off that There'll be photos, behind the scenes, sneak peeks and more. Please join me next time to enjoy the next Good Egg.